It's a, it's a joy to be with you this evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Camden Busey. I serve as a executive director of Reformed Forum. I'm also very pleased to serve as a, as a board member here at Mid-America Reformed Seminary. And I want to welcome you this evening and also issue a very uh, warm and heartfelt thank you uh, to the seminary community and particularly the faculty for allowing us to be here this evening and for hosting us and for your uh, wonderful hospitality it's a joy to be here this evening and to hear about the Trinity as we welcome Dr. Lane Tipton to lecture on Van Til's Trinitarian theology, asking uh, kind of what has become an age-old question, whether it's Reformed or Revisionist. So we, we hope to hear about that this evening, and, and hopefully it will provoke many questions in your minds and in your hearts. But why don't we begin uh, this evening uh, with uh, us, uh, a hymn. We'll sing hymn number 230 in the Trinity Psalter hymnal. If you have one, uh, we can pass them out if you don't have one yet. Number 230, holy, 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 number 230. Let us pray. Our great God and heavenly Father, we thank you this evening that we may gather here at the seminary to hear about you and to learn about you. We pray, Lord, that uh, the lectures would be edifying unto your church. We thank you that you have revealed yourself unto us as the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one essence in three persons. And we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased with our time this evening, with our conversation, even with the meditations of our minds and our hearts. We ask that you would bless us and that you would bless your church around the world, for we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Again, I want to thank uh, the seminary community here and for all those who are watching online on YouTube. We want to welcome you as well. Uh, for those of you uh, who may not know much about the seminary community here, if you're watching online, we are at Mid-America Reformed Seminary, which is just in Dyer, Indiana. Isn't it so strange that you're all here and I'm telling you about where you are? But the people online, uh, we, uh, we, it is, uh, I get here on exit one. It's right across the border from Illinois in uh, Indiana in this lovely area which indeed is uh, the homeland, uh, not the home homeland, but at least the American homeland of none other than Cornelius Van Til, who grew up just a few minutes from here in Dyer. He grew up in, in Highland, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that is who we are going to be talking about and hearing about tonight. And so for those of you who know Reform Forum and have been following what we do, you will be no stranger to Dr. Lane Tipton, who serves as the pastor of Trinity Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Easton, Pennsylvania, as well as a fellow of Biblical and Systematic Theology at Reformed Forum. We're pleased to have him this evening to deliver two lectures, again, on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology, Reformed or Revisionist. If you'd like to follow up on this, you can, you can find out several new online courses that we have for free online at reformedforum.org. We just recorded one this week. Uh, the seminary is very kind to open up a classroom for us to record that, and that hopefully will be online, Lord willing, uh, by the end of the year. But let us uh, welcome Dr. Lane Tipton as he delivers our lectures. Well, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be with you tonight. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to the uh, faculty for allowing this to happen, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about the Trinitarian theology of Cornelius Van Til. Uh, it's a topic that has been, over the past several years, uh, resurgent in certain ways. There has been renewed interest in the theology of Van Til. There have been some published works that have engaged critically with his theology. And so I think it's an appropriate time for us to spend some time looking at Van Til's doctrine of the Trinity and ask the question whether it is reformed or revisionist. And my lecture is very straightforward tonight. It's important as we begin to study and think about Van Til's Trinitarian theology to ask the question, is it reformed? Or is it revisionist in character? Is it faithful to the confessional tradition that Van Til upheld? Or does it depart from it in meaningful ways due to influences that are philosophical or theological that would push him outside of that Reformed tradition? And it's important as we begin to approach Van Til's uh, theology that we 
do our best to let Van Til speak for himself through the primary sources and in light of his published corpus. It's important for us to be as open to Van Til's system as it's presented in his work as we can be. And this is so for at least two reasons. First, misunderstandings of Van Til abound. Whether it's the work of the De Boers and others in the 1950s, John Vanderstelt in the 1970s, R.C. Sproul and John Gershner in the 80s and 90s, or John Fesco and Keith Matheson in the past few years. These misunderstandings rest in large part on a lack of careful exposition and sympathetic understanding of Van Til's published corpus. And as Christian scholars, we need to do our best to understand any theologian on his own terms and in light of the primary sources that best express his thinking on a given topic. And this leads me to a second point closely related to the first. We need to understand Van Til's Trinitarian formulae in light of a careful and patient examination of his published corpus and against the backdrop of the primary influences upon him and the theological concerns that he faced. This means that we need to be guided to a proper understanding of Van Til through a sympathetic and critical engagement of his primary works. By sympathetic, I mean that we should try to understand Van Til's own language and own theological formulae in the way he intended it to be understood. By critical, I mean we should be willing, where necessary, to subject Van Til to criticism and refinement. Certainly all of us can speak with greater dogmatic precision and fidelity. Van Til is no exception. Thus, we should not have an a priori uh, blindly to defend Van Til simply because Van Til said it, nor should we have an a priori blindly to accuse Van Til of error just because Van Til said it. We should, in short, not engage in a wholesale rejection of Van Til on the one side, nor in idealized hagiography of Van Til on the other side. We need sincere engagement, careful analysis, and scholarly assessment of his Trinitarian theology in order to be in a position where we can evaluate it, assess it, appreciate it, and apply it in ways that are fruitful and faithful. So the topic for this mini lecture series, these two lectures this evening, is Van Til's Trinitarian theology. I cannot come close to saying everything that needs to be said on this topic, so I have to be selective, and I have to narrow the topic down to the question that Dr. Busey raised at the beginning, is Van Til a revisionist, or is Van Til reformed? I hope that's an interesting enough question to raise to keep your attention as we work through this. Now, the most extensive and intensive discussion of the doctrine of the Trinity in Van Til's writings is found in chapter 17 of an introduction to systematic theology. In that section, you find the fundamental structural strands of Van Til's Trinitarian theology. So let us look for some time at that chapter and seek to understand the influences behind Van Til's Trinitarian theology so that we can be in a position to assess whether it is, in fact, an expression of confessionally reformed Trinitarian theology or if it has departed from those paths under the influence of philosophy, idealist or otherwise. And the focus of our discussion, then, is going to be, at first, on Chapter 17 of IST. If you're looking for the foundational dogmatic expression of Van Til's Trinitarian theology, the best place to begin, according to Van Til himself, is the Westminster Confession of Faith, particularly as expounded by A.A. A. Hodge in his commentary on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Having cited several standard passages of Scripture from the Old and New Testaments, that prove the doctrine of the Trinity, that underscore its revelational basis, Van Til begins his doctrinal discussion under the heading Doctrinal Statement, chapter 17. 
So in light of the number of those biblical texts that teach the doctrine of the Trinity, the first sentence in the doctrinal statement in chapter 17 begins this way. On the basis of these and other scripture passages, the Westminster Confession, chapter 2, section 3, says, In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Now, two points need to be noted here about this starting point for the doctrinal statement in chapter 17 of IST. First, not only does Van Til affirm that the revelation of the Trinity lies at the heart of the Christian religion as revealed in Scripture, but he confesses a creedal and confessional doctrine of Van Til is not a biblicist aiming at novelty. He is not a philosophically driven theologian interested in innovation beyond creedal and confessional categories. His Trinitarian formulae enshrine the classical Reformed Trinitarianism represented in chapter 2, section 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Whatever Van Til seeks to develop, it is rooted in the scriptures as that scriptural teaching is summarily expressed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. And second, and germane for our purpose tonight, Van Til begins his doctrinal statement of the Trinity with the Westminster Confession of Faith. He begins his doctrinal statement. He does not begin with a contemporary dogmatic theologian like Hermann Boving or Gerhardus Voss. He does not begin with an ancient or Reformation theologian such as Augustine, or Calvin. Instead, he begins with the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Reformed Confession of his own Orthodox Presbyterian heritage. This illustrates that Van Til, as he presents his own theology of the Trinity, begins self-consciously with a Reformed symbol. He presents himself, first and foremost, as a confessionally Reformed Trinitarian theologian. However, it's not merely that Van Til begins with the Westminster Confession of Faith. Van Til tethers his understanding of the teaching of the Confession on the Trinity to its reception at Old Princeton, represented particularly by the work of A.A. A. Hodge in his commentary on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Thus, Van Til does not simply present his own novel view of the interpretation of the confession. Rather, he takes a published work from an old Princeton theologian and relays it in capsule form and presents confessional theology as received by old Princeton as a theological institution. Van Til takes the work of Hodge in his commentary on the confession of faith and embraces it as his own. And he deems that discussion that Hodge has of the confession as very valuable as a summary of the teaching of the confession which encapsulates his own theology. Therefore, let us move on to understand the basic contours of the confession's doctrine of the Trinity as A.A. A. Hodge offers three foundational propositions that summarize the Trinitarian theology in the Westminster Standards. Van Til quotes directly these three summarizing propositions that outline the doctrine of the Trinity, and what I'm going to call it, for the sake of our lecture tonight, are the three structural strands that distinctly and conjointly represent confessional Trinitarian orthodoxy. And let me make explicit from the outset that keeping these distinct strands together at all times as mutually conditioning, mutually reinforcing propositions is as important as I know how to emphasize. 
It's not simply that each proposition is confessed and held in isolation from the others, but each proposition represents a fundamental truth about the Trinity that must always qualify the others and be understood in light of the others. And so it requires us to think in terms of the intertwining and interrelation of these three structural strands. In the section, chapter 17, entitled Doctrinal Statement, Van Til cites and quotes directly from Hodge these three mutually intertwined structural strands that form classically reformed Trinitarian theology. I'm going to read that for you. In explanation of this, A.A. Hodge says, Having before shown that there is but one living and true God, and that his essential properties embrace all perfections, this section on the Trinity asserts, in addition, first, that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are equally one God, and that the indivisible divine essence and all divine perfections and prerogatives belong each to each in the same sense and degree. Secondly, that these titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are not different names of the same person in different relations, but different persons. Third, that these three divine persons are distinguished from one another by certain personal properties and are revealed in a certain order of subsistence and operation. These, end of quote, these, according to Hodge, are the three conjointly integral aspects of a robust confessional theology of the Trinity. And so let me treat these propositions in order, and let us look at the way Hodge expounds them as they represent Van Til's own view in terms of its confessional expression as received by Old Princeton where Van Til was trained. First, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are each equally the one God, and in the indivisible divine essence, and all divine perfections and prerogatives belong to each in the same sense and degree. The point here is that while there are three persons in the Godhead, there is an indivisible divine essence that contains all of the divine perfections and prerogatives that are possessed by each person in the same sense and in the same degree. This means that the indivisible divine essence and all the perfections proper to that essence belong equally to the three persons who together are that essence. The Father is God without remainder. The Son is God without remainder. The Spirit is God without remainder. Each is God in the same sense and in the same degree. There are not levels of deity within the Godhead descending from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. To put this more directly, the divine essence is not something above, beyond, behind, or outside of each Trinitarian person. Rather, each person just is the entire and undivided divine essence. All the divine perfections and all the divine attributes belong to that essence and belong to each person without remainder. One last way of putting it, each person is distinctly and exhaustively the entirety of the undivided essence of God. Now, the implication that follows from this, according to Hodge, is this, quote, It follows that if the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost consist of the same numerical essence, they must have the same identical attributes in common, that is, there is common to them one intelligence and one will, etc. 
Now, this needs to be explained first. Hodge says there is one numerical essence, critical language in terms of historic Orthodox Trinitarianism. By indivisible and numerical unity of the essence, Hodge affirms the divine simplicity and substantial unity of the Godhead. Each person possesses all of the undivided essence and all of the divine perfections without remainder. The Father is God without remainder. Son is God without remainder. Holy Spirit, God without remainder. But there are not three gods. There is only one God with one essence, and he is numerically one. Now, this is different from creatures who have a generic unity. For instance, there's a class of people, image bearers, who all have a human nature. It's a generic unity of separate individuals within the class of humanity. But human nature does not exhaust the identity of the creature. Since there are a number of accidental properties beyond human nature that distinguish humans in the class of humanity. Some are tall, some are short, some are smart, some are wise, some are wealthy, some are not. In the human being, there is more in the particular human being than there is in the essence of the human. So we are distinguished from one another in the class of humans, not by our natures, but by additional accidental properties added to our natures that distinguish us from one another. But the divine nature is not that way. The divine nature itself distinguishes God from all that is not God. God is not in a class like humans. He is sui generis, categorically distinct from all that is created and possessed of a single numerical unity and an indivisible divine nature. There is not one essence and three separate persons, as you find with creatures who have a generic unity of essence. Rather, the divine nature exhausts the identity of God. The divine nature distinguishes God from all that is not God. God is identical to his one divine nature, and that nature cannot be multiplied in numerous instances like human nature. Nor is there something in addition to that essence or beyond that essence that further distinguishes God from creatures. God is distinguished from all that is not God by his undivided, uncreated essence, which is numerically one. This is foundational monotheism that's taught in the scriptures, confessed in the creeds, and expressed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinctly and without remainder that one divine nature and possess fully and equally all of the divine attributes. But, in addition, as an entailment of that numerical unity of essence, Hodge says that each person, quote, must have the same identical attributes in common. That is, there is, a co there is common to them one intelligence and one will. If God is numerically one, then he has one intelligence and one will, one self-conscious, self-determined existence as the one living and true God. God in his unity of essence is divided neither in his mind nor in his will. There are not three separate intelligences and three separate wills in the one living and true God. Hodge says in his Outlines of Theology, we cannot conceive of how three persons can have among them but one intelligence and one will. But this is precisely what the doctrine of God's numerical unity and divine simplicity entails. Neither the being 
nor the knowledge, nor the will of God is divided or partitioned. God's being is numerically one. God's knowledge is numerically one. God's will is numerically one. But a question emerges at this point. How do we relate the three persons of the Trinity to the one undivided essence, to the one undivided intelligence, to the one undivided mind and will? That leads us to the second and third propositions that Hodge sets forth, which we will treat together, and you'll see why. Here they are. Second, speaking now of the persons of the Trinity, these titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, are not different names of the same person in different relations, but different persons. Third, and expounding, these three divine persons are distinguished from one another by certain personal properties and are revealed in a certain order of subsistence and of operation. Now, what does that mean? Let me explain. The Trinitarian persons are not merely different names of the one divine person in different relations. They are different or distinct persons. How then do we understand them to be different or distinct persons if God is numerically one, possessed of one intelligence, one will, and one mind? Well, Hodge says first that the Trinitarian persons are distinguished by incommunicable personal properties that are not common to the three. That needs to be emphasized. Each person possesses an incommunicable personal property that is not common to the divine essence, that is not shared in the Trinity. The Father is unbegotten. The Son is begotten of the Father. The Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And these mark out incommunicable personal properties that cannot be interchanged. Paternity belongs to the Father alone. Filiation belongs to the Son alone. Spiration belongs to the Spirit alone. And these are the discriminating properties that differentiate the persons who are the one living and true God. These properties cannot be interchanged. This means there is a bona fide personal distinction within the undivided essence of God. Each person is distinguished from the other by a property not common to all three. This is one of the greatest difficulties in the doctrine of the Trinity. While confessing the undivided unity of the Godhead, and while confessing that each person is entirely that undivided essence, we also confess that there are three properties not common to the essence of God. Three, uh, pro pardon me, three properties that are not common to all persons, but rather unique to each, distinctive of each, discriminating personal properties. But what more can we say about those three in order to avoid, avoid the error of tritheism? How do we avoid risking some kind of separation of the persons within the divine essence? If these are incommunicable personal properties that do not belong one to the other, but distinguish one from the other, how can we avoid the specter of tritheism, of separating the persons from what unites. Well, Hodge adds something critical by way of explanation. This is fundamental to Reformed and uh, Catholic, lowercase c, orthodoxy. He says this, quote, The properties of each person, on the other hand, are those peculiar modes of personal subsistence 
which distinguish the relation of each to the others. You see, these personal properties are personal relations of subsistence among the persons of the Trinity. And these persons are equal in glory and power, the same in substance without remainder. So, let me put it this way. The Father, as unbegotten, is not the Son. But He subsists distinctly as the entire and undivided essence of God. The Son, as eternally begotten of the Father, is not the Father, but He subsists distinctly as the entire and undivided essence of God, and likewise the Holy Spirit. The personal properties are at the same time subsistent relations in the entire undivided essence of God. So while distinguished by these personal properties, each person subsists distinctly as the whole and undivided divine essence. No one person has more or less deity than the others. They are absolute and without qualification, co-equal, having the same substance, power, and glory. So this idea of a subsisting relation that Hodge talks about, this is what we affirm about the persons that keeps us from dividing or partitioning the essence of God. And the conception of a subsistent relation needs a brief word of explanation. For a Trinitarian person to subsist as the entire divine essence means simply that the person is related to the essence by way of identity. The Father is the essence of God. The Son is the essence of God. The Spirit is the essence of God so that each are exhaustively identical to the divine nature. The three persons, therefore, do not divide or partition the one essence of the Godhead. They subsist distinctly as it. So neither the undivided divine essence, the incommunicable personal properties, nor the peculiar modes of personal subsistence, none of those three are accidental or incidental to the life of God. They are equally basic, equally fundamental, and equally ultimate in God. This, in brief, is basic Trinitarian orthodoxy spelled out in a bit more detail than those three summarizing propositions. Now, all of this comes to expression, and this might start to sound a little bit more concrete as we move in this direction, when we realize that the order of subsistence is reflected in the order of operations. The order of operation might be a bit more concrete as we think about it. What does that bring into view? Well, when God relates to the world... He relates to that which is outside of himself. And while all the works of God outside of himself are the works of the one undivided Godhead, those same works have a personal terminus. The works of God in creation and redemption are the work of the one God, but there is a personal terminus in the work of the one God. This is illustrated most clearly, I believe, in the events of Incarnation and Pentecost. While the work of God in Incarnation is undivided, it is the Son and not the Father who is incarnate. The Son, not the Father or the Spirit, terminates in an act of hypostatic union, taking a true body and reasonable soul into union with His divine person. This is true only of the Son, even though He cannot be divided at any point from the Godhead or separated from the Father or the Spirit. 
Likewise at Pentecost. It is not the Father or the Son who is poured out from heaven, Acts 2, 22, uh, 32 through 33, but it is the person of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's terminal work consists in uniting the church to the crucified and ascended Christ, and the Spirit, not the Father and not the Son, is poured out from heaven on the day of Pentecost. This is true only of the Spirit, even though he cannot be divided at any point from the Godhead or separated from the Father or the Son. Matching then the unique subsistent relations is a certain order of operation distinct to each person in the Godhead. Unity and diversity are equally ultimate features in the life of the Trinity. Now, in evangelical theology, Hodge says that God, quote, exists eternally and constitutionally as three self-conscious persons. But for aught we know, in the depths of his infinite being, there may be a common consciousness which includes the whole Godhead and a common personality. That may be true, but what belongs with us to deal with is the sure and obvious fact of revelation that God exists from eternity as three self-conscious persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, here's what I want you to note. And the reason I'm treating Hodge so much is that after I've treated him, all I need to do is read Van Til to you. So it'll, it'll get easier here in a second. But, but I just, I just want, want to do this. It, it, it's going to pay off, I promise. Hodge, aware of the mystery involved, ventures to say that a common intelligence and a common will implies a common consciousness and a common personality that characterizes the divine unity and the divine simplicity. A common knowledge, a common will, a common consciousness, and a common personality are the entailments of the numerical unity and divine simplicity of God. Yet, at the same time, there are three distinct subsisting relations within that self-sufficient, self-determined being, three distinct self-conscious persons. So, while there are three distinct, incommunicable personal properties, three distinct modes of personal dis subsistence, and three distinct self-conscious persons. This does not suggest three separate centers of self-consciousness in the Godhead. Trinitarian persons are not individuals who are separate or independent of one another, as are human persons. They don't have a generic unity they have a specific numerical unity. Self-conscious Trinitarian persons subsist in the one essence of God and cannot have independent self-consciousness. That would be a denial of simplicity, and it would move inevitably in the direction of tritheism. Thus, there is a one consciousness that Hodge confesses due to the undivided numerical unity of the Godhead. And there is a three consciousness that Hodge confesses due to the three subsisting relations of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are the one God. And Hodge says that this must ever continue to us as a profound mystery, as it transcends all analogy. In his Outlines of Theology, just outside of his confessional work, he says, we cannot conceive of three persons having but one intelligence and one will. Yet, it is equally necessary to say that not only does God have one mind and one intelligence, but exists from eternity as three self-conscious persons. In old Princeton's reception of confessional Trinitarian theology, 
The numerical unity of God entails there is one absolute consciousness, one absolute personality. Language Bavink is going to use. We'll look at him here in a second. Yet at the same time, that theology insists that in the subsistent relations, you find three self-conscious persons in the same Godhead. God is one conscious and three conscious, and that transcends all analogy. This moves the church to confess robustly the divine incomprehensibility of God and to worship and adore the one who is one and three, three and one, the absolute tripersonal God. Now, this is not yet Van Til. This this is what Van Til quotes and presupposes that those who read him understand. And he not only quotes the three summarizing propositions, but he turns us to this section that I've just exegeted and says the whole section is very valuable for our understanding. Now, here's what I want you to appreciate as we continue to move forward. I'm about to give you a break. Come up for air. In this presentation, what you have is not a novel, speculative, philosophical attempt at Trinitarian theology. This is an exposition of the three structural strands that chart the nature of the triune God as revealed in Westminster Confession 2.3. And those Three basic points are the unity, the numerical unity of the divine essence and the divine simplicity. The fact there are three distinct persons with three incommunicable personal properties who are that essence. And the additional insight that not only are they three distinct persons with incommunicable personal properties, but each subsists entirely as that one undivided essence of God, moving us to speak of God as absolute personality in his unity and tripersonal in his diversity. And what we'll do after the break is I'll give you a shorter exposition of Bavink, who says the same thing from a different point of view, and um, then we'll move into Van Til. And I want to give you the, the idea of the thesis that I'm starting to develop. If you want to understand Van Til's Trinitarian theology, what I think he represents is the crossroads of old Princeton and old Amsterdam's Trinitarian orthodoxy set forth and advanced in a constructive and fruitful direction aimed at post-enlightenment species of unbelief in the expression of modern theology and modern philosophy. And so after this break, we'll look not simply at the English Puritan confessional influence on Van Til, but the continental Dutch tradition mediated through Bavink and what we'll begin to appreciate is that Van Til is encompassing both of these traditions and integrating them as he moves Trinitarian theology forward in the 20th century. And hopefully we can come to appreciate that and seek to do the same. So I'll give you a, a five or 10 minute break. And is, is it question time yet? Yeah, I'll just tell you, we'll do questions. One of my favorite things is question and answer time. So um, I'll try to save time so that when we finish, uh, we'll have about 15 minutes. But take about a five or 10 minute break, and then we'll swing back, and I'll go for about 45 more minutes and then wrap it up. Okay. All right, guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's gather back together. And um, I will do my very, in fact, I will stop after I've been speaking for 45 minutes. I just won't go longer. I'll, I'll, I'll think of the final 30 seconds, what to say, and just sum it all up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you say that now, right? Yeah. Um, now we've looked at the first uh, background influence that Van Til makes explicit up front in the IST, chapter 17, that is the Westminster Confession of Faith as expounded by A.A. A. Hodge. Van Til also cites in chapter 17 of the Intro to Systematic Theology, Herman Bovink, cites him a couple of times. 
Bavink says, following Augustine, that each person is equal to the whole essence of God and coterminous with both other persons and with all three. Bavink is important since Van Til understands his Trinitarian formulae to be indebted not only to the reception of Westminster's confessional theology as received by Old Princeton, but also to the continental expression of Trinitarian theology and perhaps the greatest Reformed dogmatician of the 20th century, Herman Bavink. To make explicit what Bavink is saying, let us break it down a bit. First, and this is review, each person is equal to the entire essence of God. After working through the Hodge material in the Westminster Confession, that's self-evident. There's nothing in the person that is not in the entire and undivided essence. We've seen this through Hodge. Secondly, each person is coterminous with the other persons. Coterminous means most basically that the persons are absolutely equal in every respect. The persons are not outside, behind, or in any way beyond the divine essence. But Bavink adds something that is not made as explicit and programmatic as you find in A.A. A. Hodge. Bavink, uh, Hodge spoke in hesitation about this. Bavink affirms it up front and then develops it. Bavink speaks of the quote-unquote absolute personality of God. On pages 302, page 302 of his Reformed Dogmatics, Bavink says the following, and listen. He says, all three persons have the same being and attributes, and hence the same knowledge and wisdom. Sounds just like Hodge, doesn't it? Because it's Reformed Orthodoxy. He says, goes on to say, the unity of the divine being opens itself up in a threefold existence. The persons are not three revelational modes of the one divine personality. The divine being is tripersonal precisely because it is the absolute divine personality. Here, Bavink situates the tripersonality of God as the unfolding of the absolute divine personality and the unity of the divine being, which is one in knowledge and wisdom. The divine being is tripersonal precisely because it, the divine being, is the absolute personality. Please recognize what Bavink is saying. The absolute personality of God's divine being opens itself up in threefold existence. The divine personality, the absolute divine personality, which is one in God, opens itself up in a threefold existence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The underlying conception here is that the absolute divine personality itself subsists in a threefold manner as Father, as Son, as Holy Spirit. This is the complement to what Hodge says about the individuals or the persons who subsist as that divine essence. Bavink amplifies. He says this, In God, these three persons are a threefold differentiation within the divine being. This Self-differentiation results from the self-unfolding of the divine nature into personality, thus making it tripersonal. Bavink in this quote works in what we might call, possibly, I hope this is useful language, the reverse direction from Hodge to come to the same conclusion. The essence of God is itself something that subsists tripersonally subsists in a threefold manner, a unity that contains within itself the self-differentiation of Father, of Son, and of Holy Spirit. So one can either speak of the essence 
as subsisting in a threefold manner, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Or you can speak of the three modes of personal subsistence who are that undivided divine essence. Bhavik can speak of one absolute personality that unfolds in a threefold way, a threefold subsistence. Or he can speak of the persons as three distinct modes of personal subsistence who are the divine nature. This is language that we're about to hear Van Til quoting and developing along with Hodge. But one last point from Bavink is worth uh, accenting. Discussing Augustine's conception of divine unity, Bavink did not hesitate to denote God's unity in substantial and in personal language. He observes that Augustine, quote, does not derive the Trinity from the Father, but from the unity of the divine essence from the Godhead. Neither does he conceive of it as accidental, but as essential to the being of God. According to him, the mode of personal existence pertains to the being of God. In that respect, personality is identical with God's being itself. Only a few sentences further, Bavink says what Van Til quotes, every person is identical with the entire being, equal with the two other persons taken together, or to all three. Thus, there is an Augustinian foundation to this insight, that the absolute personality of God subsists in a threefold differentiation of Father, Son, and Spirit. Bavink distinguishes between God as absolute personality and his unity and modes of existence in his diversity, a legacy that derives from a self-conscious Augustinian tradition. Now, I have spent so much time on the sources that Van Til cites in chapter 17 so that we can be in a firm position to inquire of Van Til's formulations. Is Van Til innovating due to deviant philosophical speculation in the tradition of absolute idealism? Is he infected with innovation and novelty? Is he deflecting from orthodoxy? Or is he following the path that was set by old Princeton and old Amsterdam represented by the work of Hodge and Bavink. At this point, it might feel anticlimactic if you've read Van Til. But, having examined the sources Van Til cites for his doctrinal formulation of the Trinity, let me read to you quotations from Van Til and let the primary sources speak for themselves and let us draw some conclusions. Van Til in chapter 17 of the IST, says this. Over against all other beings, that is, over against created beings, we must therefore hold that God's being presents an absolute numerical identity. And even within the ontological trinity, we must maintain that God is numerically one. When we say that we believe in a personal God, we do not merely mean that we believe in a God to whom the adjective personality may be attached. God is not an essence that has personality. He is absolute personality. Page 220 of the IST. Please appreciate what Van Til says here. Following Hodge and Bavink, Van Til speaks of God as an absolute personality as the direct outgrowth of the numerical unity and the divine simplicity of God. The ontological trinity, he says, is numerically one. This means that when we speak of God as personal in his unity, we are not saying that he is an essence who has a personality. That would be to add something, namely personality, to what God is, namely his essence. Personality would then be something added to the essence of God as an accident, thereby denying the numerical unity of the divine essence and denying the divine simplicity of God. 
Personality would be something additional to the essence of God, a feature that God takes to himself or wills, perhaps a property that exists outside of him that he brings into relation to his essence extrinsically. So when Van Til speaks of God as absolute personality and says that he is not an essence who has personality by way of addition, he is seeking to root absolute personality squarely in the numerical unity of the divine essence and the divine simplicity of God. The dependence on both Hodge and Bavink are obvious once you've read them. So much so that it strikes me as surprising that some would be themselves surprised that Van Til would speak this way unless they were antecedently surprised that old Princeton and old Amsterdam spoke this way. Van Til's conception of God as absolute personality is the outgrowth of the numerical unity of the essence and the divine simplicity found in the works of Hodge and Bavink as they are amplifying reformed confessional Trinitarianism. To make this explicit, let me quote from two pages earlier in the IST, page 218. Ventil says, there is then no distinction between absoluteness and personality. God does not merely have personality, but is absolute personality. Do you hear that? No distinction between absoluteness and personality, because the unity of the divine being The numerical unity of the essence entails it. However, in the very next sentence, listen to what Van Til says. He says, yet within the being of the one person, we are permitted and compelled by Scripture to make the distinction between a specific type of being and three personal subsistences. God is one conscious being And God is also a triconscious being. It is there that Van Til follows what Bavink has presented in his Reformed dogmatics. Within the being of the absolute personality of God, we are compelled to affirm the reality of three personal subsistences. And these three personal subsistences are the full unfolding of the absolute personality of the one living and true God. Three distinct persons subsist as the entire and undivided essence of God. And from that, Van Til concludes, God is a one conscious being, and yet he is also a tri-conscious being. The one consciousness is an entailment of the simplicity of the one divine essence. The tri-consciousness is an entailment of the subsistent relations within that divine essence. Tri-consciousness represents personal subsistence, the real distinctions among the persons who are God, and uniconsciousness, the simplicity of that one absolute personality. Now here's a place where there could be some opportunity for us to fine-tune and offer critical reflection on Van Til, but note this. For Van Til, God as a divine person and God as an absolute personality are synonymous expressions. Let me try to prove that. First, the quote from uh, Introduction to Systematic Theology, page 230, listen. God is one person. When we say we believe in a personal God, we do not merely mean that we believe in a God to whom the adjective personality may be attached. God is not an essence that has personality. He is absolute personality. Do you hear that? One person and absolute personality define one another. They are synonymous for Van Til. Both are entailments of divine simplicity and absolute numerical unity. Moreover, God's being as absolute personality does not introduce the problem of a fourth person, since as Van Til says, within the being of the one person, we're permitted and compelled by Scripture to make the distinction between a specific type of being and three personal subsistences. 
So for clarification, this is not designed to make a judgment on Van Til's language, but simply to seek to make clear what he intends to convey. The language of one person is a synonym for absolute personality. That's how he intends the terms to be used. We might want to be a little bit more analytical, introduce some distinctions, and try to work out some differences between the two. But for Van Til, they are synonymous at every point. Van Til's not introducing a fourth subsistence into the Godhead. He is simply trying to speak in terms that are consistent with the unipersonality or absolute personality of God. In fact, to give you one more example where Van Til uses these terms interchangeably, in Defense of the Faith, um, page 28 of the first edition, he says that God's absolute personality involves self-conscious activity, and in the next paragraph, changes his language to say that God is an absolute personality. In three successive sentences on that page, Van Til alternates between absolute personality, absolute person, absolute personality to denote the same Trinitarian reality. There is no evidence in the paragraph Van Til intends, Van Til intends to convey anything different about the Godhead by his change in terminology. So the parallels are striking indeed and illustrate that Van Til is by no means innovating in his Trinitarian theology. He is using the language, conceptual framework, and categories that he inherited from old Princeton and old Amsterdam. So I think along these lines, it's best to understand Van Til's Trinitarian theology as a unique expression of the best insights taken from old Princeton and old Amsterdam. The English Puritan and continental traditions converge in Van Til's synthetic appropriation of Trinitarian theology in the service of Reformed apologetics. It's quite a breathtaking endeavor. It's ecumenical in that rich and robust Reformed sense of the term. But I would be remiss if I did not give you one last insight that bears on the integration of Trinitarian theology and the image of God and covenant. You may have been listening to this lecture and saying to yourself, what is the cash value of all of this? I've heard about numerical unity and simplicity and subsistent relations and, and um, the absolute personality of God unfolding in and subsisting as three distinct persons. How does this bear on the development of Reformed theology? Well, we've already seen the groundwork that Van Til has laid through the work of A.A. A. Hodge and Boving, but I want to call your attention to Charles Hodge. And let me get, begin by giving you a quote from chapter 17 of IST. Van Til's quoting Hodge, and he develops this in, his, in this chapter and in another place. And it introduces the, the uh, category of Trinitarian perichoresis. Trinitarian perichoresis. Let me give you the quote, and then let me amplify it in the time we have left. Hodge says that as the essence of the Godhead is common to the several persons, they have a common intelligence, will, and power. There are not in God three intelligences, three wills, three efficiencies. The three are one God and therefore have one mind and will. This intimate union was expressed in the Greek church by the word perichoresis, which the Latin words in extentia, in habatio, and intercommunio were used to explain. That's from volume 1, 461 of Hodge. In short, Hodge argues that while the persons remain distinct hypostases, they have one mind and one will as they indwell and inhabit one another personally. This is a distinct concept. And Hodge also says this fact, which Van Til quotes, of their intimate union, communion, 
and inhabitation of the persons of the Trinity is a reason why everywhere in Scripture and instinctively by all Christians, God is addressed as a person in perfect consistency with the tripersonality of the Godhead. Now let me point out what Hodge is saying here and then amplify it. Hodge is saying not only do the persons subsist in the divine essence so that the Father distinctly subsists as God, the Son distinctly subsists as God, and the Spirit su distinctly subsists as God. But they also, as such, indwell one another in the sense that there is a personal union, a personal communion, or a personal inhabitation of person in person. These are also known not only not as relations of subsistence, but co-inherence. Person dwells in person. This is a critical feature that Van Til develops in his work. And let me give you just a bit of amplification on it. Francis Turretin, in his Institutes 1, 257, I find to be stellar on this. And I want to share this with you and, and amplify it. He says that the term empericoresis, quote, was not used without reason to describe the intimate mutual union of the persons that can be inferred when the Son is said to be in the Father and the Father in the Son, John 10, 38, 14, 11. Continuing the quote, they thought this mystery could not be better expressed than by the phrase enalon empericoresin, i.e., a mutual intertwining or in existence and eminence so as to designate that union by which the divine persons embrace each other and permeate, if it is right to say, each other. So that all ways remaining distinct Yet they are never separated from each other, but always coexist wherever one is, there the other also really is. Three comments are in order. First, perichoresis takes for granted the absolute numerical unity of God's essence and the relations of personal subsistence in that undivided essence. Perichoresis is not competitive with that. It's not seeking to replace it. All that we saw from A.A. A. Hodge and Herman Bavink is maintained. The presupposed frame of reference for the reality of perichoresis takes for granted the unity of essence and those subsistent relations that are that essence. But second, perichoresis brings into view the mutual personal union of the members of the Godhead. It is not only that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit subsist as the entire divine essence distinctly. It is not only that the divine essence subsists in a threefold distinction, but there are also, in addition to relations of person to essence, relations of person to person. Perichoresis brings into view the mutual indwelling of divine person within divine person. Person is interior to person as they indwell one another in this embrace. And Turretin uses two conceptions to describe perichoresis. The first is mutual permeation. The second is Mutual embrace. First, the persons permeate one another in their relations. Now, this is hard to describe. If I had a board, I'd probably put a bad diagram up and try to show you what it looks like. But the persons are entirely and exhaustively interior to one another. They dwell in one another. They exhaustively inhabit one another. 
There is no initial exteriority or space that is closed by the persons. They are never in any way personally separated and needing them to be brought together as they subsist distinctly as the divine essence. They are exhaustively interior to one another. Exhaustively permeating one another. Yet, in that permeating and exhaustively interior relation, each retains his incommunicable personal property. The Father, paternity, the Son, filiation, the Spirit, spiration, from the Father and the Son, filial claim. But second, and this, this is important, the persons, according to Turretin, embrace one another in the ineffable interiority of these coherent relations. This conception needs all the attention we can give it. It warrants a separate lecture. The permeating relations are relations of mutual personal embrace. This is analogous to a fellowship bond between the creator and the creature in the Garden of Eden. But it is categorically different than that relation. Because the relation between the creator and the creature has a distance, a religious distance, Westminster Confession 7.1 speaks of. The permeating personal relations of perichoresis are entirely interior and the embrace is accordingly one of interiority. They embrace one another in perfect interior inhabitation without losing their personal identities. Perichoresis is thus the conceptual capstone for a full-orbed reformed Trinitarianism. Each person subsists as the entire an undivided essence of God, person essence relation, but also embraces and permeates the others from the inside, person to person relation, or a relation of co inherence. The exhaustive relation is a relation of embrace, and this transcends all creaturely analogy. It cannot be found among creatures. Creatures don't have the numerical unity. They don't subsist as the divine essence. And they don't exhaustively permeate and embrace one another in an, in an interior personal relation. However, and this is where I hope this will move you toward worship and drive you to become better covenant theologians. While this does transcend all creaturely analogies by way of um, finding something perfect, there is one, one good one. Perichoresis, if we can conceive it, is the archetypal relation in the Trinity that is replicated in the new relation of creation sovereignly willed by God when he creates Adam as the image of God. Adam, as the image of God, is created in true knowledge, original righteousness and holiness, and in a religious relation to God that consists in personal fellowship expressed in worship. That's what it means to be the image of God, to be in personal relationship to the self-contained, condescended triune God, and to worship him according to his revealed will. As the image of God, Adam is created in natural religious fellowship, and that movement from God to Adam, entering into a relation that is religious and personal, it is the created ectype of the Trinitarian perichoresis. It is unique to the Reformed tradition, as it is put here. The Reformed view of the image of God is distinct. This cannot be found in the Lutheran view of the image of God, 
Roman Catholic view of the image of God, the Arminian view of the image of God, the Pelagian view of the image of God. This is characteristic of the Reformed view of the image of God. And if you want to read about it in a, in a section that I find delightful, uh, Voss's Reformed Dogmatics 2, pages 13 through 15, develops this over against Roman Catholicism in a delightful way. But I'm digressing, and I'm sorry. Secondly, not only is perichoresis the, the Trinitarian archetype for the religious relation of Adam as the image of God, it is also the reality that grounds God's covenantal condescension in an act of special providence to advance that natural religious relation to consummation. In other words, perichoresis is the Trinitarian archetype for the conception of the covenant that God enters into with Adam. I'm not going to speak about the Pactum Salutis. It would be a fun topic to lecture on. But what does the covenant offer? The covenant of works offers confirmed and consummated fellowship with the triune personal God who is Adam's blessedness and reward for his perfect, personal, exact, and entire obedience. If Adam obeys under the covenant, he will advance from the estate of innocency to the estate of glory, and he will receive God as his blessedness and reward. The consummation of the covenant relation is that he comes into an unbreachable and immutable bond of religious fellowship beyond probation in Eden, in consummated Sabbath rest. That is the fruition of covenant. Turretin's language of embrace in perichoresis offers us with something of the divine ontological archetype for the natural religious relation between God and image-bearing Adam under covenant. Ventil builds on this point. I can only point you in that direction. This would be a separate lecture. But Ventil builds on that point in the IST chapter 17 and develops that point extensively in chapters 6, 8, and 9 of the Survey of Christian Epistemology in what he calls the representational principle. We lectured on that. Camden and I were in the room next door, lectured on that a little bit this week. But let me just point this out. That Van Til's integration of Orthodox Trinitarianism and its application to a Reformed doctrine of image and covenant is the stuff of which constructive reformed theology is made. Orthodox constructive reformed theology that integrates Trinitarianism with a distinctively reformed and biblical view of the image of God and the covenant that advances the natural religious relation to its consummation prior to the fall, and that reaches its consummation in the person and work of a crucified and ascended Christ, the second and last Adam, the representational principle, Van Til's Trinitarian theology, is a wonderful, useful formula. So I must conclude with this observation. Van Til's Trinitarian theology seeks not merely to maintain confessional orthodoxy, which I believe it does, but it seeks to apply that orthodoxy to the development of reformed anthropology, covenant theology, apologetics, and eschatology. His Trinitarian theology is in one sense little more than a restatement and synthetic expression of the English Puritan and continental reformed confessional traditions. Yet the application of that Trinitarian theology to a wide range of topics, including the development of Reformed apologetics in conversation with modern theology, Bart, Rahner, modern philosophy, absolute idealism, personalism, neo-evangelical rationalism, Gordon Clark and others, and a host of other uh, things. Van Til's work blazed a trail in the 20th century that remains open for us to continue to explore, 
refine, and develop as we seek to be reformed and reforming according to the scriptures. So the conclusion I want to leave you with tonight is that Van Til was reformed and not revisionist, but he did not say the last word. We must continue to speak and build and enrich and develop that theology in the service of the church as that theology bears on the issues that face us today, ranging from the resurgence of interest in neo-orthodoxy to the rise of interest in Roman Catholic theology, we have a distinctive, reformed, confessional alternative rooted in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, and Van Til's work urges us to continue to develop that in the service of the triune God, to the glory of his name, for the sake of Jesus Christ, and for the sake of his church. So I'll leave you with that and encourage you to take up your old Princeton and old Amsterdam resources in either hand and put Van Til in the middle and keep reading all three. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, I have already some questions right up here. And um, I'm going to read them and make sure I understand them. And I, we have, I'll let you know this. This is, I, I guess it's a weakness of mine. Um, when I was in Jakarta about eight years ago, please don't get up and leave when I tell you this. I did Q&A for six hours. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's not even, not even ever going to happen again. But they, we, I started at about seven and it just went. It just went on and on and on. I really enjoy Q&A time. I, I do now. I may not be able to answer the questions that you ask. You might put me on the spot, but I enjoy it. So I, I'm going to read these two questions, try to give a quick answer. Sometimes my answers get long and I don't intend for them to. I just try to be thorough and concise and sometimes the two don't 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 uh, interpenetrate. They don't inhabit one another well. Um, there comes humor. See, I can be humorous once I finish lecturing, uh, and I don't mean to be. Um, now, here's the question. How do we avoid a sort of collectivity of the divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, as, a, as a kind of society, a collection of, of persons, a corporation of sorts? Um, I'll, t I'll make you aware of two theological uh, expressions of what is called social Trinitarianism. The first and most popular species is, was pioneered by Jürgen, Jürgen Moltmann. I'm from Texas. It's very tough. Jürgen <laughs> Moltmann, it's tougher than you think. And um, his work on Trinity and the kingdom, a crucified God and others posit that to begin with an essential or substantial unity is fundamentally wrong-headed. He wants to begin with three separate self, separate self-conscious centers that are united by what? United by love, united by a common mission, united by a common goal. The unity is functional and not substantial, operational and not essential. And it's just in the affirmation of an undivided, simple, numerical unity of essence that you avoid this social Trinitarian construction. So that first proposition that Hodge affirmed is absolutely critical. There is no Trinitarian theism without a robust monotheism. The scriptures won't let you get away from it, um, and the our confessional tradition won't let you get away from it. The second expression, and I'll just be brief because... Um, it, his work isn't as notorious, but it's uh, equally uh, moving in the social Trinitarian direction. Cornelius Plantinga uh, has, has offered work that is also moving in that same direction as Moltmann. It's not as radical. Uh, it's not um, cast in the same way that Moltmann casts it. But um, th that social conception where the unity of the persons is a social functional unity um, a unity of purpose, of love, of desire, of goal, a uh, common purpose for social justice if you move in the direction of li liberation theology. The, the only way to avoid that is to affirm substantial unity, which the scriptures do teach. There's one God who has one nature. Second question here is, um, could you elaborate on how reading an Enlightenment conception of personhood into Van Til's language 
would affect our understanding of his Trinitarian theology? It's a really good question. Let me put it this way. An enlightenment conception of personhood. If you think about Rene Descartes, how did Rene Descartes go about trying to find certainty? He climbed in a Dutch oven and started doubting everything that he could doubt. He doubted his... Uh, he doubted the existence of an external world. He denied, he, he started doubting the reliability of his senses. He started doubting um, the reliability of his reason until he reached something that was indubitable. And so what was it? Dubitu uh, ergo sum. I doubt, therefore I am. But more popularly, I think, ergo I, I am. I think, therefore I am. And in that movement, you get the idea of consciousness as an absolutely isolated, discrete entity, totally divorced from all reality around. It's like a brain in the vat. It's like Neo in the Matrix, right? Just totally hooked up and alone, separate. And if you take that conception of personhood, like a Cartesian conception of personhood modeled on human consciousness, you have absolutely lost Trinitarian orthodoxy before you get out of the gate. You are already pre-committed to the notion of discrete, separate, self-conscious centers in the Godhead modeled on the creature, and you fundamentally denied the big circle and little circle, starting with the big moving to the little. Instead, you're moving from the little to the big. It's univocal reasoning. And so if that, if Ventil, you know, were to do that, what would he be doing? He would be denying numerical unity. He would be denying simplicity. He would be denying subsistent relations. And he would instead be affirming discrete self-conscious centers. And that would be the error of tritheism or moving in the direction of some permutation of social Trinitarianism. And, um, and so... While Ventil's aware of post-Enlightenment conceptions of personhood, where does he begin? He begins with a confessional, theological conception of triune personhood and not an Enlightenment one. Um, but if that happened, and I know some who have tried to read Ventil that way, um, if that were to happen, it would be, um, it would be a disaster. It would be a disaster. Other questions on anything in the lecture or things that might be related to it? Yes, sir. You oh. um, mentioned the influences of uh, old Princeton and Puritans and continental reform uh, dogmatics. Is there, can you comment on the relationship of Van Til's formulation of the Trinity with the Southern Presbyterian uh, tradition? Is there any difference in man like depth and his uh, formulation of the Trinity in Van Til, or would you find similar? Well, he, here's what's interesting. Yeah, the, the question is this. We've talked a little bit about uh, Old Princeton's Trinitarian theology and Old Amsterdam's Trinitarian theology. What about the Southern Presbyterian tradition? How does Van Til relate to the Southern Presbyterian tradition? Does he show influences by it? Is he similar or different? Thinking perhaps of Dabney in, in his Trinitarian formula. Well, as far as I'm aware... There is no innovation in the Southern Presbyterian doctrine of the Trinity per se. I think on that point, there is no fundamental difference, and this might be a rare one, between the Northern and Southern Presbyterian traditions. I know there are a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of differences. Um, as far as I'm aware from Dabney's discussion, Dabney's actually got quite a strong doctrine of simplicity, as I recall. It's been a while since I've read Dabney, um, and I don't remember him. Um, uh, departing from what you would call a, a classically reformed theism. But Van Til, for better or for worse, is influenced not only by the Westminster Confession of Faith, but by its reception in Old Princeton. And so he's in a much more of the northern uh, Presbyterian um, expression of the tradition. I wouldn't see any fundamental departure I uh, wouldn't see any fundamental difference, but I nor do I see any self-conscious dependence on those sources for Van Til's work. A large part of it depends on the fact that Van Til was trained initially at Calvin, 
and then switched to Princeton, was reading Bavink uh, in Dutch uh, for, for years. And so I, I would say that would not be uh, any fundamental departures that I'm aware of, but no self-conscious dependence or desire to express that per se, due in large part, I would just say, to some parochial uh, limitations of his education and his background. Sir. Dr. Minninger. Yes, sir. Um, am, I, am I right to say that your, your take on Van Til here, when Van Til speaks of God as one person, you're saying that what Van Til means is in fundamental continuity with Reformed Orthodoxy, but the way Van Til says it isn't necessarily the clearest and most helpful. Is that what you intimated in... Well, here's here's what I here's what I would would say about that. Van Til, I don't think we should have a problem saying that God has one intelligence, one will, one mind, that He's self determined, self revealing, and in the sense that Bavink is using the language and that Hodge uses the language, an absolute personality. Uh, so Van Til's using that language, and he's wanting to say God doesn't have personality, he is that. And that's the is of identity in terms of the simplicity tradition. When he goes on to use the language one person, he uses it in a way that is identically uh, or, or is synonymous with uh, absolute personality. Why? Following Hodge and following Bavink, he wants us to recognize that we cannot give a, um, a rendering of the divine being in a way that eliminates mystery. And so if he's going to say God is one conscious and three conscious, uh, absolute personality, and yet three persons, he's going to say God is then also one person and three persons as an entailment, one person is an entailment of simplicity and numerical identity as three persons, an entailment of the subsistent relations. Do I believe we could make, uh, make the case a little clearer if we started making more distinctions? Yes, I think, it, I think that could happen. Um, I, I don't think Van Til was wrong to do it, but I think that when you start, I think what, what some people find shocking about Van Til is you're reading along, and if you know the Westminster Confession, you say, okay, God is one in essence and three in person. And then you read Van Til, page 229, 230 of the IST, God is one person, three persons. And then you come back and say, what, what, what was that? One what? Oh, that's heresy. You know, that's the, that's the, the intuition that you have. But if you recognize that that one person is a, an apologetical restatement of absolute personality in order to challenge univocal reasoning and say that you cannot penetrate to the depths the Almighty. If it's got an apologetical concern to accent divine incomprehensibility, I think Van Til's perfectly within his rights to do it, but it takes a lot of time to understand all of the Trinitarian theology behind Van Til's statement. And that's what I aimed to do. So um, I don't have a problem with it. I don't think it's wrong to do it, but it requires at least a two-hour lecture to try to explain why uh, Van Til was doing it. And um, I think it's got a, a useful apologetical function, accenting divine incomprehensibility and challenging univocal reasoning to speak the way Van Til spoke. But we can always, like I said, try to be clearer um, and be more rigorous and um, express the doctrine more clearly as we're able and reflecting on it. Question two? Well, I just wanted to know if you had a, a formulation that you preferred more. Is it, 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 in terms of seeking greater clarity, less uh, misunderstandability, so to speak, um, is it simply sticking more with what, say, Bobby said? and not incorporating, uh, again, not that it's wrong to, but for the sake of clarity, perhaps, not incorporating Van Til's more innovative way of saying it, yeah. something else? Well, um, I think all of the ways that we saw Hodge speaking, 
all of the ways that we saw Bavink speaking, Van Til speaks that way. What he does in addition is designed, uh, especially in, in the IST, is designed to um, lay bare rationalists who want to move in a direction where God is thought of as something less than personal. In fact, in, in the Ventil module that Camden and I just did um, next door, there is um, a, a wonderful apologetical reason why Ventil said this, and I'll give it to you. Um, if you bring into view the Trinitarian theology of Gordon Clark in his uh, book on the Trinity, page 106 of that book, he says that God is, the, that the persons of the Godhead are bundles of thoughts and that they are to be contrasted to an unconscious mute substance. That's a quote from, from, from uh, Clark. So that when Clark is trying to describe tripersonality, and he uses the most innovative language I heard in the 20th century, bundles of thought, three thought bundles. I, or my bundles of thought, am the Father. I, or my bundles of thought, am the Son. I, or my bundles of thought, am the Spirit. That is his principle of individuation. He then contrasts that principle of individuation to what is one or common in God, and in order to avoid any kind of possible contradiction, steps up to the plate and says that God's substance is mute and unconscious, therefore antithetically related to any conception of that which is personal. So it's an impersonal substance. And what Van Til's trying to say, especially in the context of IST, right around the time of the Clark controversy, is that is absolutely not where we go. So how does he counter it? He says, well, God is absolute personality. He's not an essence that has a personality. It's not additional. That absolute personality is such that we will call him an absolute person in a manner, following the Hodges, that is consistent with the tri-personality of God. Mysteriously consistent, but consistent. And so I think, especially if you start to see some of the issues that Van Til was dealing with with Clark, I think that polemical context motivated him to speak that way. And if it's not a context that's charged that baldly with someone saying, hey, God's an unconscious mute substance distinguished by three thought bundles, which is a real big problem. If, if someone's not saying that, then maybe the polemical um, language that Van Til's using of one person and three person might not be as necessary, and you might want to go with more of a traditional Bavinkian, Hodgian way of, of putting it. And um, so it, I think it could be kind of a, a situation-specific um, polemical decision to make. It's the best thing. Triune always works. It's triune personality. A, a, a triune personal God. Yes, sir. Dr. Venema. <laughs> Yes, sir. That's true.
suggests that these cards from historical form, or even lowercase c, Catholic, Trinitarian Orthodoxy, but it's, it's, it's most unhelpful. We should have had an editor who told him to revise that, or clarify, or explain what he's saying. Yeah, I... always with respect to Western Trinitarian formulations is that they don't adequately distinguish the persons. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There's curses, you might say, or a sequel to Unitarianism that works here, the three modes of being. But, um, and of course, on the other side of the divide, on the Eastern tradition, um, the West worries about tritheism, too much of a differentiation. Um, and that's why I think in the, the more ecumenical consensus language of the creed and confession, the term one in being, three in person, rather, I think, carefully and consistently employed, and they're not used equivocally. And, and I think that's what Bill does. And it's, I, I, I appreciate that. I think that there's a sense in which, um, you know, like Robert Lethem uh, in his book on the Trinity says almost exactly the same thing about Van Til. I appreciate his intentions. Don't think he's heterodox, but I don't see how that language is helpful. And um, the, 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 the progression of the arguments. See, I, I think I think there's a difference between the creedal or confessional statement that speaks of God as one in his essence, one in his substance, three in his person, and and that we're not predicating four persons as subsistences or subsistent relations. That's crisp and clear and absolutely. Uh, foundational to orthodoxy. And I think that your point is, is a well-taken point. I think what Van Til um, saw is that the progression in the, if you say, okay, God is one essence, what does that entail? What does the numerical unity of his essence, what does the simplicity of his being entail? Well, Van Til looked at it, and he's, here, here's what he's looking at. He sees Hodge saying, one mind, one consciousness, one personality. He sees Bavink speaking of one absolute personality, one wisdom, one purpose. And, and all of these categories that are talking of the essence of God, especially with Gordon Clark in the room, um, these are not impersonal categories. And so Van Til, I think, was trying to find a way to express the essence of God in a way that didn't introduce a fourth hypostasis, but didn't run into the idea of an impersonal, mute, unconscious substance like you found in Gordon Clark. And so I think that the, the places where he says that, um, I think he, he's got Boston personalists in view. God is one person but not three. Gordon Clark, God is three persons, but a mute, um, um, unconscious substance. And so I think that, that what, what motivated it was a, was a desire at a, at a deeper level to parse out what that essence means. And he ran into so many categories from old Princeton and old Amsterdam that moved him in the direction of talking about absolute personality and, and unipersonality that um, I think he, he, he tried to move in that direction in order to showcase incomprehensibility. But I will grant that if, if there is a better way, if you can stop, say where Bovink stopped, um, if you can put it in a way that doesn't risk 
misleading people. I, I, I do see your point. There's a pastoral concern there. There's a concern to make sure you're reflecting the truth of the creeds and the confessions and you don't want to subvert them. And, um, and I think Van Til was just, I, I, at the end of the day, was asking this question, one mind, one will, one consciousness, one personality. It looks like as an entailment of divine simplicity, we have to say God is one person, but in a way that c is consistent with these three subsistent relations. And then on your point about the, um, the East, when they locate the unity of the Trinity, they do it in the Father as the RK. And that really bugged out Augustine and Calvin and his doctrine of auto theos. So it, it, it is, I, I do think it is one of those issues where uh, a lot of patience and understanding need to be exerted. And I think Van Til is open to criticism on that point, the kinds of criticisms that you're making. I don't think he runs into modalism or, or heterodoxy, but I do think unless you really uh, look at the, the polemical concerns that he has, um, uh, upon a casual read, it can be downright, it can look downright wrong and, and misleading. Dr. Strange? How does that apply to occasional theology? Mm -hmm. The crazy confession are, and Catholic theology are transcending occasional theology. But this is occasional theology. Yeah, it is. And the point is, if Gordon Clark, he really bugs me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could understand being moved to say a lot of things by Semper Rational. And I was just thinking as an editor of the Trinity, Culture Hymnal, that I was glad nobody submitted a hymn with that point of view. I could imagine singing that Dr. Clark notion of the Trinity. Uh, bundled. Uh, holy, holy, <laughs> holy, holy bundles. But, but, but what you're expressing is, and, and you talk about this with theologians, but someone like um, Knox, for example, John Knox, gets scored at a few points, and what you have to recognize is he was rarely ever doing an apocryphal or what we call systematic theology. It was very much occasion theology. It was always polemical and pastoral from his perspective. Yep. And he was yep. trying to address something and answer something. And I just found as a historian, when you're, when you're doing that, you're liable to say something in that moment that if you just abstract it and look at it, it's like, what? He yeah. said, what? You know? Yeah. And I think this is one of those instances because I don't think Yeah, in the course, just for a brief uh, comment here, um, what we do at the very end of the course, uh, the last uh, two lectures, is having presented Van Til's context, the, the, the two polar far sides on Van Til's um, um, radar are the personalists who say that God is a supreme person, but they cannot confess tripersonality. They let unipersonality make not so clear the distinction of persons. So you've got one person, but not three. And then Clark has three thought bundles with a mute substance. And I, and I do think that when Van Til's speaking polemically, that he's, it, it's an occasional ad hoc critique that's aiming at both one conscious and three conscious, one person and three person. But I, I do think that when he's expounding his theology, he's uh, saying everything that is consistent with the creeds and, then, and confessions and then trying to make some apologetical applications. So 
this is a wonderful opportunity for us to continue to think through these issues and how Catholic confessional orthodoxy relates to formulations in a polemical context. So appreciate the discussion, appreciate the insights. We, uh, good. Do you, do you need to? Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming, but why don't we give uh, Dr. Tipton a, a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what a tremendous uh, opportunity. This is the type of thing we like to see, brothers in the Lord who are working out and, and seeking the truth, uh, the truth that has been revealed to us, obviously in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, but also uh, leaning upon and standing upon uh, the Orthodox Reformed creeds and confessions as they faithfully summarize uh, the truth that's revealed in scripture. Uh, this has been tremendously encouraging. We'll still have time uh, insofar as uh, I, I'm cleaning up with the equipment. There's still plenty of time. I'm, I'm sure uh, I don't I hope I don't get locked in this evening or, or Dr. Tipton and I get locked in because of the questions going on so long. But I, it would be remiss if I didn't uh, once again say thank you so much uh, to Mid-America Reform Seminary, particularly the faculty and the staff who have been tremendous and always kind and generous. Thank you for inviting us and allowing us to, to be here this evening and to all the people online. Uh, you can find out more information about the seminary at midamerica.edu, or you can call there. The contact information is at the bottom of their page, and you can find out more about their programs. And it's an exciting time here at the seminary. It truly is. It's a wonderful place, a wonderful place for uh, working out reformed thought and a wonderful place that is focused and in, in deeply committed to training men for gospel ministry in reformed and Presbyterian churches. So thank you again, Mid-America. Thank you to everyone who was able to watch online. We are deeply grateful for you as well. And uh, we ask you to head on over to reformedforum.org. There you'll find information about all of these resources and the upcoming course on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next time. We'll enjoy some time of refreshment and questions and answers. Thank you.